Moby Dick, by Herman Melville. Chapter 32. Cytology. Already we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unshored, arborless immensities, ere that come to pass, ere the Pequod's weedy hull rolls side by side with the barnacled hulls of the Leviathan, at the outset it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough appreciative understanding of the more special Leviathanic revelations and illusions of all sorts which are to follow. It is some systematized exhibition of the whale and his broad genera, that I would now fain put before you. Yet is it no easy task. The classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less is here essayed. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. No branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cetology, says Captain Scarsby, A.D. 1820. It is not my intention, were it in my power, to enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetacea into groups and families. Utter confusion exists among the historians of this animal, sperm whale, says Surgeon Beale, A.D. 1839. Unfitness to pursue our research in the unfathomable waters, impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the cetacea, a field strewn with thorns, all these incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists. Thus speak of the whale, the great Cuvier, and John Hunter, and Lesson, those lights of zoology and anatomy. Nevertheless, though of real knowledge there be little, yet of books there are a plenty, and so in some small degree, with cytology, or the science of whales, many are the men, small and great, old and new, landsmen and seamen, who have at large or in little, written of the whale, run over a few colon dash dash the authors of the Bible, Aristotle, Pliny, Aldervandi, Sir Thomas Brown, Gessner, Ray, Linnaeus, Rondelidius, Willoughby, Green, R.E.D., Sibbald, Brisson, Martin, Laspide, Bonterra, Desmarest, Baron Cuvier, Frederick Cuvier, John Hunter, Owen, Scarsby, Beale, Bennett, J. Ross Brown, the author of Miriam Coffin, Olmsted, and the Reverend Cheever. But to what ultimate generalizing purpose all these have written, the above cited extracts will show. Of the names in this list of whale authors, only those following Owen ever saw living whales, and but one of them was a real professional harpal oneer and whale man. I mean Captain Scarsby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority. But Scarsby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale, compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. And here be it said, that the Greenland whale is an usurper upon the throne of the seas. He is not even by any means the largest of the whales. Yet, owing to the long priority of his claims, and the profound ignorance which, till some seventy years back, invested the then fabulous or utterly unknown sperm whale, and which ignorance to this present day still reigns in all but some few scientific retreats and whale ports, this usurpation has been every way complete. Reference to nearly all the Leviathanic illusions in the great poets of past days, will satisfy you that the Greenland whale, without one rival, was to them the monarch of the seas. But the time has at last come for a new proclamation. This is Charing Cross. Hear ye, good people all. The Greenland whale is deposed. The great sperm whale now reigneth. There are only two books in being which at all pretend to put the living sperm whale before you, and at the same time, in the remotest degree succeed in the attempt. Those books are Beals and Bennett's, both in their time surgeons to English South Sea whale ships and both exact and reliable men. The original matter touching the sperm whale to be found in their volumes is necessarily small, but so far as it goes, it is of excellent quality, though mostly confined to scientific description. As yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lies not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. 
Now the various species of whales need some sort of popular comprehensive classification, if only an easy outline one for the present, hereafter to be filled in all its departments by subsequent laborers. As no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my own poor endeavors. I promise nothing complete, because any human thing supposed to be complete, must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. I shall not pretend to a minute anatomical description of the various species, or, in this place at least, too much of any description. My object here is simply to project the draft of a systematization of cytology. I am the architect, not the builder. But it is a ponderous task. No ordinary letter sorter in the post office is equal to it. To grope down into the bottom of the sea after them, to have one's hands among the unspeakable foundations, ribs, and very pelvis of the world, this is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this Leviathan? The awful tauntings in Job might well apple me. Will he the Leviathan make a covenant with thee? Behold the hope of him is vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans. I have had to do with whales with these visible hands. I am in earnest, and I will try. There are some preliminaries to settle. First, the uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cetology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether a whale be a fish. In his System of Nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, I hereby separate the whales from the fish. But of my own knowledge, I know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, alewives and herring, against Linnaeus' express edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The grounds upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows, on account of their warm bilocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, penum intrantum feminum mammis lactantum, and finally, ex lege naturae jure meritoque. I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin, of Nantucket, both messmates of mine in a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. Be it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish, and call upon holy Jonah to back me. This fundamental thing settled, the next point is, in what internal respect does the whale differ from other fish? Above, Linnaeus has given you those items. But in brief, they are these. Lungs and warm blood, whereas, all other fish are lungless and cold-blooded. Next, how shall we define a whale, by his obvious externals, so as conspicuously to label him for all time to come? To be short, then, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have him. However contracted. That definition is the result of expanded meditation. A walrus spouts much like a whale, but the walrus is not a fish, because he is amphibious. But the last term of the definition is still more cogent, as coupled with the first. Almost anyone must have noticed that all the fish familiar to landsmen have not a flat, but a vertical, or up and down tail. Whereas, among spouting fish the tail, though it may be similarly shaped, invariably assumes a horizontal position. By the above definition of what a whale is, I do by no means exclude from the Leviathanic Brotherhood any sea creature hitherto identified with the whale by the best informed Nantucketers, nor, on the other hand, link with it any fish hitherto authoritatively regarded as alien. Asterisk hence, all the smaller, spouting, and horizontal-tailed fish must be included in this ground plan of cetology. Now, then, come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. I am aware that down to the present time, the fish-styled lamatins and dugongs, pigfish and sowfish at the coffins of Nantucket are included by many naturalists among the whales. But as these pigfish are a noisy, contemptible set, mostly lurking in the mouths of rivers, and feeding on wet hay, and especially as they do not spout, 
I deny their credentials as wells, and have presented them with their passports to quit the kingdom of Cetology.